Hi, everybody. This is Bob Olson with Afterlife TV. You can find us on AfterlifeTV.com, where we search for evidence of life after death. Today is a perfect example of that. I'm here with Marvina Meek. She has had a near-death experience. I love talking about near-death experience. To me, it's one of the most compelling pieces of evidence of life after death that we can, we can find out there. A lot of people have had near-death experiences where they die for uh, a few seconds to a few minutes and then uh, leave their bodies, go into the spirit world one way or another, and then uh, come back into their lives. Um, every single experience is a little bit different, and I heard about Marvina's, and it's absolutely fascinating. Welcome, Marvina. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Good morning. Thank you for having me on your show. And you're out there in Texas. I hear it's, uh, you say it's very cold today. It's in the 60s. It's freezing. <laughs> I'm from Maine, so that doesn't make any sense to me, but that's okay. I would love to be in the 60s right now. <laughs> Anyways. is good for me. <laughs> you have a fascinating story because, first of all, not just the near-death experience, but the fact that you were a rodeo cowgirl. I mean, that's just fascinating to me. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it means to be a trick rider and a trick roper. Well, I have always had a passion for horses since I was a little girl. All I wanted to do was ride my horses and do fun things with them. I started trick riding and trick roping whenever I was a teenager. I was a barrel racer, I, I roped calves, I even roped bucking horses for a short time. Wow. That was another almost a mini near death. <laughs> that was, you know, have you heard people say that I got hit so hard that I saw stars? Yeah. I know what that means. <laughs> I know, I, you know, I always thought about it, I'd heard cowboys say, you yeah, know, I landed on my head and I saw stars. but. That really happens. It really, it does. It it's does. not just not just an expression. It's a real thing. It is not an expression. <laughs> so I I used to rodeo. I was a, a rodeo queen. I was a trick rider. I was a trick roper. I was a barrel racer. So I just had this um, wild life. I traveled all over the United States. I have performed in like forty two states. Oh my goodness. You know, three or four countries in South America, Mexico. I didn't even realize that you could do that sort of thing. Do you travel around with a group and do, is that what you do? You travel around with a group or do you go to, do you just find out where the rodeos are and you go there yeah. individually? You go individually and sometimes you might have someone that travels with you. But for the most part, you travel either by yourself or maybe with one or two other people. Wow. So I was a contract entertainer. So that means that rodeos would contact me to come and do my show, do my trick riding, do my trick roping show, and so that's what I did. They would pay me to come. That's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Never met anybody, so this is cool. This is uh, double cool for me today. Uh, do you do any of that today anymore? I do. I still <laughs> love to trick rope. I don't trick ride still. When, when you trick ride, you really need to um, do that like all the time just yeah. as a safety thing so that your mind is always on the different safety factors that need to be in place. And so your body is in good physical shape and your horse is in shape and they're in shape mentally too. So you either need to do it or not. I and I, I haven't trick rode in you know probably 10 years. I love to. Sometimes I just I get a a yin to you know hit the rodeo arena and have those bright lights in your face and you smell that you know the 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 arena the dirt and everything the cattle and the horses yeah. and it's a blast. Um, trick riding is truly a blast, but it's just uh, one of those things you either need to do it or not do it. And I I like sleeping in my own bed now. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Exactly. And and so and safety is one of the reasons that you have to do it all the time. And that's exactly what happened with you. Tell me what how old were you when you had this near death experience? I was it was like four days before I turned twenty one. Oh, okay. All right. And so uh 
what what led up to it? I understand you were a little uh, being rushed along. You were next. Uh, tell me about that story about what led up to it. Well, I was um, at a little country rodeo, and it was in the Ozark Mountains, and they staggered the entertainment in between the events, and so they were doing an event that's called bulldogging, and bulldogging requires two guys on two horses and one steer, and they had a lot of guys in this particular event, so they probably had like 30 guys. And all of them go into the arena at once, and they kind of hover down at one end. They run their cattle out. They do their run. And then they all come out at the same time. So the guys were all, like, filing out of the arena. And the rodeo announcer was, like, ready to get on with the show. And so he, uh-huh. um, he calls me in. And for trick riding, you have to have your saddle really tight. And when you pull your saddle tight, um, you're, you basically have about 10 or 15 minutes to do your whole ride, to oh. get in the arena, do your show, and get out of the arena before your horse just really stresses out and then passes out or something. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, it's like really tight so that your saddle doesn't uh, fall off while yeah. you're sideways or upside down, which would be disastrous. Yeah, yeah. And so did you not have the opportunity to really tighten up your saddle before you were, had to go out there? I did. The announcer uh, called me and told me, you know, in a few minutes we're going to be getting ready. So I have my saddle pulled tight. So my horse and I are ready. Yeah. We're ready to rumble. Okay. And they're playing our music and the announcer is, you know, from Dallas, Texas, Miss Marvina, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, there's a timing thing. And it's like whenever they're calling your name, you should be, like, running into the arena, you know, with yeah. a big smile on your face. And and I couldn't because the daggum bulldoggers were, like, bottlenecking the alley. And oh. there's, like, all these horses. And I'm one, and I'm going against the grain. Yeah. And my horse is getting really agitated because... He, he knew we needed to be there, and there was a lot to get through. And, and a horse's herd instinct takes over also. So oh. they're like, here's all my brothers, and they're going this way. Yeah. And here's this little thing on top of me wanting me to go that way. Yeah. So you have a little bit of an agitation there, too. All right. So let's get to the accident. So what actually happened then? You, 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 I know you fell off your horse. Tell how that happened. Well, I did not fall off my horse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. We don't want to spread that rumor, do we? No, no way. Was, no, okay, all right. No, no, the horse flipped up. He, What he did is he reared up, and he just he just took, he had a belly full. He was pitching a hissy fit, oh. and he just reared up, and he was, like, standing on his back leg, and he, um, he just fell over backwards on top of me. Wow. And so I actually had time that I could have just bailed off of him. And I I could have just slid off the back of him and regrouped. But there was, I'm a very stubborn individual. And, you know, I, um, if I would have got off of him, then my costume would have got dirty (laughs) in the alley. Yeah, and you don't what you know. You wear like these little wrestling shoes to trick ride in, yeah. so that you can do the different things with the straps and stand on the horse because you can't do that in cowboy boots. Yeah, and so I didn't want my shoes to get dirty because then they would be slippery when I got back on him. Yeah, so I was very stubborn. I said no. I was trying to talk him into getting back down. Yeah. And he was 1,200 pounds at the time. I weighed 105 pounds. Oh. He was. <laughs> no. My God. So what he did is he just, he, he flipped over and he just threw himself backwards. And um, a trick riding saddle, I don't know if you've ever seen one, but it's a, it's a very special built saddle. The saddle horn is like six inches tall so that you can hold on to it with both hands. Okay. And it's about the size of a 50 cent piece. Okay. Uh, the diameter. And so... 
actually the saddle horn is what probably saved me, saved my life. Really? Because the, the saddle horn hit the ground like right beside my stomach. And it, when the horse was on top of me, the saddle horn kept all of the weight of the horse from crushing me. Amazing. But it was still, it was amazing. It was like, I think it was a divine intervention. Yeah. I think it was really it was a God thing that God said, you know, we want you here a little bit longer. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, certainly that could have gone right through you instead of saving you. It, you say it was right next to your stomach. Um, and... At what point, so do you pass out immediately? What happens when you hit the ground and this horse lands on top of you? Immediately. You I immediately was um, thrown out of the body or pulled out of the body or pulled out of awareness. I don't know how you want to, I really don't know how to explain it. Yeah. But it was like um, you, you uh, disconnect from your body so fast it was amazing to me because once the horse got up and that's where I actually got all my injuries is the horse rolled over and to the left and then my leg my left leg was there and so all of his body weight landed on my leg and I broke my leg in a couple places and then I broke a few ribs and oh my goodness it's horrible yeah. And yet, at the very few seconds that all this is happening, you're you're actually out of your body. Right. So, so at this point, you're not feeling it yet, correct? No. What are you? So you you've left your body. Do you actually see it? Can you see your body? Well, that is a really curious thing that you asked. That yes, I um, I remember looking down at me, and that's how quick you disassociate yourself from your soul essence and the vehicle of, of your body is because I was looking down at me and my left toe was like pointing at my left ear. Ooh. I was like, I was just like a wadded up mess. Oh. And I remember thinking to myself, I thought, she looks a mess. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, she, I didn't say I. Oh my goodness. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, it's that just that message right there alone is so important because uh, there's a lot of people who have lost loved ones, um, as you know, and that are curious about whether their loved ones suffered in, in the death. And it, we hear about, you know, there's a lot of theories out there that people have left their bodies before the plane crashed or before the car accident or whatever. And whether it be before or instantaneously or whatever it may, it's great to hear someone who actually died and left their body that it was instantaneous before you felt any pain. And then there you are again looking at it, referring to yourself in the third person. Yeah. And, you know, what did you think about that gal that was there? Did uh, What did you think about the body? Now, first of all, the body is a, a slight mangled uh, in this yeah. But I've heard that a lot of people, they'll look at their bodies and go, oh, I can't believe, you know, what well, they're like, they're not, did you feel any affinity with it? Any any connection with it at all at that point? I was thinking, say la vie, baby, I'm out of here. <laughs> you did. I did. I just thought, I thought, well, she looks a mess. And then I thought, oh, okay, that's that with that. Totally disassociated from the, the life of Marvina, really, at that Thank point. You. Do you I know? Did. did you know who you were? Did you did you feel Mar like Marvina still? Did you? I did. I totally felt like Marvina, but I had a, an expanded sense of knowing and an expanded sense of awareness, and I had a complete sense of calm. Calm, great. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, I, I've heard this before. This sense, this peace of mind that overcomes you, and yet at this point, you're you're, you're all by yourself, and. And so there's no fear. You're not feeling any sense of fear, uh, any confusion? Nope. No confusion, just just total calmness, looking at this mangled body. Glad you're not in there, <laughs> I guess, right? Yes, I was. I mean, you know at this point that that's where you came from, right? Right. I knew that. Okay. All right. I knew that I had parents and I had family. Oh. And I had three boyfriends in different states that I was leaving behind. <laughs> <laughs> <Cardio> cowgirl. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's great. I love that. I was All right. Single. 
So it you knew those time. things. Uh, do you feel connected to those people? What What are you thinking? I know all this happens very quickly, but but in hindsight, I know you can. You're sometimes amazed at how much you you really were thinking, all the thoughts that were going through your thought. What sense of connection with these loved ones uh, did you have in that state? The people that I was worried about most were my parents. Yeah. And I had a like a little bit of a glimmer of um, worry that at the same time I had an intuitive understanding that they will be okay by and by or that they will understand by and by my decision. Ah, interesting. I did have a worry about them, but yeah. it was um, I sort of um, – processed all of that really fast yep. and just I knew where I needed to go and what I needed to do intuitively I just knew all right well let's go to, let's go there so what happens uh, obviously this is all happening very fast right did it feel mm -hmm. like it was in slow motion or did it just feel like normal it, it didn't feel like I was being rushed at no. all okay and so you're you're finished looking at your body I take it you, Mm -hmm. At what point you've just, you've seen enough and it's time to go? You don't you know, and Very you know, quickly. and you know where you're going, right? <laughs> I do. How do you know where you're going? Intuitively, I think I just had like an internal GPS system that just locked in, and I absolutely felt like I've been here, done this many times, ah. wasn't even worried about it, and just had a sense about. The direction and what was next and I was looking forward to it I was excited about it I love this because I'm a I'm a very practical guy okay and in my research of the afterlife I know that there's a lot of people who believe in earthbound spirits because they're lost because they don't know they're dead this sort of thing I personally don't believe in it but one of the reasons why is a story when I hear stories like this you knew where you were you it's not like you were lost you just had an intuitive sense of where you were going you know you've done it many times before I love this and it, like you said just so that this internal GPS that was just gonna get you back home did it feel like home to you it did it felt like um, I was totally at peace I totally felt immersed in a, a sense of well-being a sense of love, even a sense of connectedness to the universe. Yeah, I was totally in my zone. Okay, so tell me what happens from here, because I'm curious. No, you're still alone. I mean, you're still not, there's no other beings around you at this point, right? Right. There, okay. there wasn't anyone around. I felt like I was drawn to move up and to my right hmm. and as far as the direction and uh, maybe just a little bit in front of myself. Okay. But up and to the right, and I just uh, sort of like turned my head and turned my attention that direction. Yeah. And I was, it seemed to be drifting or moving uh, that way. And I had a, uh, a short little glimpse of um, maybe one or two spirits like on my left hand side and they sort of had this look about like <laughs> you know like watching me go past <laughs> and uh, that was that was my impression and I just um, I sort of at the same time I had a, I heard them one of them say well what's she doing here and what I thought when they said that, I had a thought of they're not talking me out of it. Ah, okay. So let's stop there. So this is this is amazing. Um, do you know if these were deceased relatives or people you knew from past lives or any any connection with these people? Obviously, they knew who you were. They weren't relatives. I feel like they were my team. Okay. They were my, my inner circle of my spirit guide. All right. And <laughs> so they see you. It's kind of hard to fathom how this can happen, that this you'd end up there and they wouldn't know it was coming. So that's a little discomforting. But <laughs> I 
I, I think they had to do um, they had to do some um, fancy footwork to fix <laughs> 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 it. <laughs> yeah, but your so your first sense though after they say what's she doing here is you want to argue to stay. Is that what it is? I remember I turned my head around to my left and I was like, you know, ready to put my little hands on my hips and like, I'm not going back. <laughs> Get it. And I was going to argue my case. I was very determined that they weren't going to make me go back. And I don't even know how I, I don't even know how, why I felt that way so quick. I mean, this all yeah. happened. Very, very fast. Did, so I didn't get a chance to argue. Okay, you didn't get a chance to argue. Well, let's get to that in a second. I'm curious about this. First of all, let me just back up a little bit. Uh, do you feel any sense of body, some kind of ethereal body? Did you did you recognize yourself as still having a body, or were you just a ball of light? I totally felt a sense of being, not maybe not immersed in a physical body, but I felt alive. I totally felt brilliantly alive. Mm. And I felt a sense of me, you know, separateness. But I wasn't the me that you're looking at now. Yeah. So, but I did feel a sense of individuality. Okay, sense of individuality. Still recognize yourself as Marvina, but did you recognize yourself as other personalities from other lifetimes too? No, I didn't. I didn't yeah. have any awareness of any other lifetimes. Okay. Um, really fascinating. And I love how you said you just sort of turned your focus in one direction and you moved. That's how you moved. So mm -hmm. it really is, you hear so much about you really move around by thought and that's uh -huh. the way it worked for you. For me, yeah. No steering. Um, involved. <laughs> when you got to this place where you actually saw the other beings, probably your spirit guides, and they they see you uh, in surprise. What is this place like? Is it is it bright light? Is it what 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 did that? How did you sense it? It wasn't bright light to me. It was what I would sense as what I call the void. Mm -hmm. And to me, the void is just this velvety blackness. But at the same time, it, it's, it's light, too. So it wasn't like golden light or blinding light. It yep. was a velvety, like a wound face, uh, but there was light within it. And so that's how I sense them. Wow, that's kind of a contradiction there, isn't there? The, the light within the darkness, yeah. The light within the dark. And yet, not a fearful dark as so many humans think of, yeah. of that. Yeah. No, it was a, um, it was a velvety feeling. Like, um, uh, it's hard to really put words to, but it was like you could almost hear music as like a crystalline sort of a sound and that went infinite. Interesting. Now, I have heard that before, this, this, uh, this music that people can't really describe. Mm -hmm. this is, what, can you, what would your description of that be further than what you've said? Is it, I mean, is it in the background? Is it? It's in the background. It's sort of like someone hits a, a chime, and then on the very end of the chime, the notes where it goes on and on and on. It, it, was, it was very beautiful. And uh, it was like a tone. <laughs> what a beautiful description. I, I love that. Um, really, geez, it's just so interesting. It brings so many questions to mind. But so you, um, the first thing, so you're, you're just about to, to argue your point. You don't get the opportunity to what happens from that point on. Well, I think they started running some extreme damage control. <laughs> 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 they were busy, <laughs> so they. I did not get to say one word on my behalf. I. I mean, it was. It was like I turned my head to the left, and I was ready to put my foot down. No, I. I want to stay. I'm already here. I want to stay. And they. I didn't get to. 
So they, what I think happened is they did an extreme damage control and just kind of like got me back in my body. I, all, I think all of the cords were not mapped out, but, but it, it was enough that they could get me back in. And then when I got back in the body, it was, it was, I totally lost my sense of um, that well-being because you're back in the body. Yeah. The body is, is really messed up. And so there was huge amounts of pain. There were all of these guys that were standing over me. And <laughs> one of them, bless his heart, he... he got my leg, he straightened my leg out. My leg was like, my toe was like right up here by my head and it was really uncomfortable. And I know he probably wasn't supposed to move it. Yeah. I mean, you always hear, you know, don't move them, don't <laughs> That's touch them. Right. I was very grateful that he moved my leg back in the proper place. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, wow. That, that's great. I was great. very grateful. <laughs> Lucky that guy came along and yeah, and, yeah. and didn't, didn't know or just didn't fall what uh, directions. He was probably following his instincts, I would imagine, at that time. All right, let me back up. So when you go back, there's no – you're arguing, but all of a sudden, is it just like flick of a switch, kind of like you wake up from anesthesia? You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. like – Yes, that back. You're back there again. Nobody's saying see you later. <laughs> no, no. Okay, they, they you said didn't something. Give me a pep talk. They didn't. No. <laughs> oh, Marvina, remember this. Yeah, remember yeah. This. Nothing like that. No pep talk. No, I didn't get the phone home long. <laughs> That's too bad. You you said something about the cords. Uh, describe that. You were talking about cords. Is that what you're saying? Like not all the cords were broken or something? Explain that to me. Well, we have these uh, cords that sort of um, kind of tie us into our body. You know, we have one to the heart, uh, one to the solar plexus, and one that's in the brain. And at the time of death, it's like the first one to go is like the solar plexus, and, and it snaps. And when it snaps, it's like the, the body begins to – that's whenever the body starts to cool off and uh, the life force energy is not moving through – the physicalness and then the heart uh, seed out and snaps and then the brain. It's like once the, all three of them are pulled out, it's like all of our awareness is pulled out of the physical. There's no more life force energy that is uh, within the physical body to enliven it. And uh, so that's whenever we have a sense of going through the tunnel. So you've heard about that where you go through the tunnel, you see all of the images of uh, of your life, the things you've learned, the things that have really imprinted you. When that particular little cord snaps, that's whenever we can get that. All of those, um, like those images and videos, like when we import on our camera, from our camera to our computer, and yeah. you see going back and erasing, yeah. it was, you know, just that fast. Okay, and um, and so you're just assuming that at least one of those cords was still intact in order for you to be able to go back. Well, I think they all were intact. Okay. And uh, or I don't think I would have been able to come back. Okay. So, so that was probably the pathway that my guys were able to like get me back from there to here. I, yeah. you know, I still had that connection with the body. Yeah. How long were you out? Do you know? I wasn't out very long. Yeah, so they we're talking. I wasn't probably even out over a minute or two. Yeah, of course. It, did it did it feel like much longer while you were having this out of body experience? It felt it felt a long time. It did. Uh huh. That's neat. Yeah. Uh, all right. So now you're back, and you, all the pain is there. Boom. Just horribly. Right. How long before? Um, you remembered this experience that you had? Because I mean, I imagine at that point, you, you're not remembering it instantly, are you? Is it something that maybe like the next day or something, after all the pain has, uh, you know, you're on medication or something, you remember? How does that work? It was probably after the really good medication wore off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> you know, it was probably like a, a couple of weeks. I think I slept so much uh, for about a month. I, I slept. I was in the hospital for about a month, and um, 
I slept as much as I could just to get away from the pain. Yeah. But it was it was in the hospital while while I was there. Yeah. Wow. So long recovery time for you. Well, it was six months before I could walk again. Whoa. Yeah. I forgot how to walk. I, I would watch little kids walk across the floor and I'd be thinking, how they do that? Really? <laughs> I forgot. I forgot what it felt like to walk on my own. Okay, so I understand you broke your legs. Is, is so? Was there? Did you also hit your head? Was there neurological damage? How's that happen? I my head was slammed against the ground, but the saddle sort of protected my whole body, so I had a bit of a cushion okay. there. So I didn't have a head injury. Do you have any sense of what it was that led you to have this uh, sort of death experience? I mean, you died for however long, if, even if it were seconds. It, it was the slam to my tailbone to the back, really. That was the slam oh. that, you know, shoved me out. Because that was the area that most of the weight of the horse hit. So, okay, tell me about when it started to come back. You, does it, do you wonder if it's a dream? What, how's that, how's that <laughs> happen with you? Question it? Yeah. Yeah. You do wonder if it's a dream, and but I had a lot of time to think about it. <laughs> yes. There's nothing else to do. So. Yeah. yeah. Who, who was the first person you told about it? Well, um, I didn't tell anybody about it for a long time, long, 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 long time. Yeah. Okay. And what? And why was that? I mean, I think we know, but. Well. It was just so out of the box in, from where I was from. And I mean, I was a rodeo cowgirl. I was raised a Baptist. And um, that just, um, those sorts of things just didn't happen so much. They actually probably did, but we didn't, we didn't talk about them. Rodeo is a very dangerous sport. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that there are a lot of my friends, especially like bull riders and bronc riders, that have had the same sorts of experiences. Yeah. But nobody to talk to you about it really either. At that age, had you ever heard of a near-death experience before? I don't even think so. Yeah. So this is new. Did you feel very lonely with with this uh, knowledge of what you had, what you went through? No, I didn't feel lonely. I felt a little bit like I had a cool secret. Ah, ah, that's neat. Mm -hmm. And was the memory of it very vivid as if it had just happened, even though even years later, even today, is, is the memory of it very, very vivid, like a real vivid dream? I think then it was more vivid than it is now. Yeah, so it, it does dissipate over time. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about it now? You look back at that experience, and what is that? What benefits? Um, what are the pros and co even the cons of having an experience like that? Uh, for, what, the, what were they for you? Well, it was one of the most remarkable, coolest, most spectacular things that ever happened to me. I don't recommend it. Yes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. It was. It was it was painful. I don't recommend that. Uh, yeah, there's easier ways. Meditation would be a better way. <laughs> Vision <laughs> questing would be a okay. better way. But it's. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but it was. It was one of the cooler, life-changing moments. Did it lead you to question? You talked to your Baptist. You know, whatever the religion, and it doesn't really matter. Did it cause you to question some of the things that you would learn through religion growing up? Yeah. It totally. Did. Yeah. It totally challenged my belief system that I was brought up in, and I really wasn't what you would call like a a practicing Baptist, but I was really imprinted that way and raised that way. Yeah. But it really challenged my ideas and my um, my whole thought process, thought yeah. process about life after death and all of that. And. Uh, any last any last words you want to uh, give to people uh, about this experience or anything else? Well, the only thing that I can say is that um, when you take time to meditate and to create a relationship with your own 
team, your spirit guides, your angels, and especially your most holy guardian angel, that that is something that can help you get a sense of who you truly are and what your soul's path is really about without having to go to the extreme of, of having a, a life death yeah. change. Yeah. So, Do you fear death now? No. no. I, I don't care if you fear death at all. No, no. All right. Well, Marvina, Marvina Meek, uh, your website, it's going to be listed below these videos, but it's M-A-R-V-E-E-N-A, -E -E Marvina.com, correct? Yes, that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you and hearing all about your story. It was really great. Well, thank you, Bob. It was great to meet you. Same here. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye now. All right.